We have the same desires for goodness, same emotion, same potential for goodness or badness. All six billion human beings. Thomas Merton showed me his retreat space. His personal lifestyle was very similar to mine. It was the same lifestyle as mine. He would get up at 2:30 in the morning to meditate and study. And at 7:30 in the evening, he would go to sleep. I get up at 3:30 in the morning and go to sleep at 8:30 in the evening. If we remain distant, we do not understand each other's practice and traditions. But if we get closer, we find that we are not so different. The one who has attained final integration is no longer limited by the culture in which they have grown up. They have embraced all of life. They have experienced qualities of every type of life: ordinary human existence, intellectual life, artistic creation, human love, religious life. They pass beyond all these limiting forms. While retaining all that is best and most universal in them, finally giving birth to a fully comprehensive self, they accept not only their own community, their own society, their own friends, their own culture, but all humankind. They do not remain bound to one limited set of values, in such a way that they oppose them aggressively or defensively to others. They are fully Catholic in the best sense of the word. They have a unified vision and experience of the one truth shining out in all its various manifestations, some clearer than others, some more definite and more certain than others. They do not set these partial views up in opposition to each other, but unify them in a dialectic or an insight of complementarity. With this view of life, they are able to bring perspective, liberty, and spontaneity into the lives of others. The finally integrated one is a peacemaker. This kind of maturity is exactly what the monastic life should produce. The monastic ideal is precisely this sort of freedom in the spirit, this liberation from the limits of all that is merely partial and fragmentary in a given culture. Monasticism calls for a breadth and universality of vision that sees everything in the light of the one truth. Of course, as a Buddhist,、uh, Zen is a part of Mahayana Buddhism. We take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Those are basically what I don't know if love is a good word or not,、mm. but in a sense, that is love.、Mm. And、uh, Dogen says, Buddha is a good teacher, and Dharma, Buddha's teaching, is good medicine, and Sangha is good friends that help. Us, each other, to recover the health, mental health. Those are the three most valuable things for all Buddhist. But those, according to Dogen, those three are not really three, three different things. But、uh, Buddha, as Dharma Kaya or Dharma Body, is this、uh, entire universe, entire reality. And Dharma is how、uh, all beings are within this、uh, entire universe or entire、uh, 
uh, network of interdependent origination and all beings within that interconnectedness are Sangha. As a religion called Buddhism, Buddha, Dharma and Sangha means Shakyamuni and his teaching and people who study what Buddha taught. According to Dogen, those are not only a uh, way to see those three treasures, but this entire universe in which we are living and how that is Buddha and how those things are existing, that is interconnectedness, that is Dharma, and all beings existing within this interconnectedness are Sangha. So actually this is what we love <laughs> and we trust. I think the very basis of uh, Mahayana Buddhist teaching is interconnectedness, because we are each beings are empty, that means lack of uh, self-nature, that is an uh, independent entity. We, are, we cannot be independent entity. We can uh, live or exist uh, within interconnectedness. Uh, that means we are supported by all beings, not only people but we are supported by air, water, and everything. There's no way to live without uh, uh, gratitude, because we can live based on you know, support by all beings. Without support by all beings, we cannot live even exist. You know, we, our thinking is very ego-centered, but this ego-centered way of thinking can be because of the support by others, you know, even our language, you know, in my case Japanese, uh, is a gift from the Japanese society or tradition. You know, Japanese people lived in that islands, uh, had been developing the language, and because I was born, somehow, you know, uh, I was given Japanese language as a gift. And I used the lang Japanese language to create a very egocentered <laughs> idea. <laughs> so even our egocentricity is a product of interdependence. So uh, we cannot live without gratitude, appreciation to all beings in which we are living together. Uh, because we are living together with all beings, we have to uh, live based on that reality. And yet, that is very difficult to understand and see in our way of thinking. That's why we need those vows. Those vows are not, uh, how can I say, came from our thinking. That's why, you know, in order to, in order not to be deceived by our thinking, that is always uh, self-centered, uh, I think we need vow as a, a part of interconnectedness. We need to vow to live on that uh, reality or, or foundation. But our thinking is always deviated from uh, that reality. You know, for all of us, me is most important than others. Others are not so important, like me, myself. That is a kind of a natural thing in our thinking. In order to put more value on that reality, fundamental reality than my thinking, my personal view, personal limited habitual way of thinking. Uh, I think that is why we need vow. Vow is not uh, something we can think of. There is only one self ultimately, and this is God manifesting in us. And this manifests most effectively when we're not thinking about ourselves at all. It's just being who you are as a human being, and who you are is, is a rational animal that is being deified in communion with all other human beings. 
So we, we are influencing other people by our personal work on ourselves, not for our own sake, but for the transformation of the whole human family. Our own spiritual life has to be a combination of this capacity for solitude with God and, and communion and service of others. Service is considered the best practice to further the interior life because it's closest to the idea of, of alert receptivity and, and passivity that is not just uh, emptiness but openness to the inspirations of the spirit. There is this possibility of serving God in the human race through humanitarian service and uh, of dedicating our life to God, whether it be in a, uh, a community so dedicated or in the difficulties of life and the service that is required there. So, so that project now can draw on the evidence of sociology and biology and, and psychodynamics because we know that everything in the universe is interconnected and interrelated. So that relating is what being really means. So that just being born is to be in relation with, uh, specifically with every other member of the human species past, present, or to come, or, and with all creation, because we've depended on the, all the other levels of evolving creation to have the necessary physiological tools and capacities to function on the human level. So we re really see ourselves then as a macrocosm in which all the major expressions of God's creation are, are somehow united in a single consciousness which itself then is capable of enormous growth beyond anything that we can imagine. The word that comes to me that, that, that allows me to um, reflect on, on, on that kind of encounter is what is termed uh, synchronicity. Somehow I was at the right place at the right time to meet that person or to meet this situation. It's always been kind of magical. It's been kind of, wow, isn't that an incredible coincidence and so on. And I've given up on, on that explanation. I just have. It, not that there is a, a predestined destination, but I believe that there is a field, again, of energy. There is a field of possibility. We talked a little bit about the, the imbalances in life. And that at some point, just like an uh, earthquake happens because uh, some, something finally has to shift, something happens, and then boom, you get that earthquake. So it is in the social milieu that you can live life as if it wasn't going to change, but pressures are building. Things that you don't know about are building. And therefore, there will be a happening, there will be an encounter. Call it with a mystery, call it with the way life is, but at some point that imbalance will come at you. If you are resonant with that life, that same encounter will come as here is something that you can act on that will release that pressure, that will, that will be part of the solution, will be part of the creative process. And I've had many of those happenings that when I look back on, I'd say, wasn't that coincidental? And that's the way I, I did it early on. Just going back to chemistry, and I invented this compound. It was coincidental. I mean, it really, 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 really was. One of the things we used to do is we, we, we would get scientific journals from the library. There was no internet, of course, at those points. You couldn't go on and find things. You had to search for things. And so we would circulate the Journal of Organic Chemistry, the Journal of American Chemical Society, the, the this, the that, and so on and so forth. There was 
dozens of journals and you signed up for which ones you wanted brought to your desk and usually you just scratched your name off and put it in the out box. You, know, you didn't have time for it. But I signed up and one of them, God knows why, I signed up for was the Swedish Journal of Organic Chemistry. And this one day I picked it up and I usually just put it in the out box and I just, I leaf through it, you know, just and I saw this chemical. And I said, that's what I need to make. But it, it had to be modified to, to be an, a, a, a stabilizer, an antioxidant. It was not. It was simply an a isocyanuric acid, for those who want to look up the term, base uh, chemical. But I said, that might be what I need to make. And that became the, the crystal. And I've often seen creativity, as I talk about, as, as, as like a crystal. See, in chemistry, when you make something new, it's, it, it tends not to be a crystal. It, it tends, if you're making an organic chemical, it tends to be a goo. Because it's never been made before. It's never had a form before. It's never existed before. So it doesn't necessarily crystallize, get into orientation a crystal has to have. And so what you do is you scrape the side of the test tube and you do all sorts of, you dissolve it and bring it back down and so on and etc. etc. et cetera, et cetera. And it always has impurities in it which keeps it from crystallizing and so on. But once it crystallizes, once it takes form, then it always crystallizes after that. And not just you, anywhere in the world. If somebody made that chemical, it will not come as a goo, it will come as a crystal, if it's pure. For years, that was known as the crystals in the beard theory. <laughs> in the 1800s, the chemists would make things and they would think that, well, what happens was that because it crystals, they get in the beard and when they walk around, they, they just sort of disperse in the air and that's how they become something that something else can build on, you know? Not true. You know, there's a morphogenetic field. I not just believe in, I really know that it happens. So that <clears throat> time and space don't matter. When it happens, it happens, that crystal consciousness, if you can use that term, that crystalline reality is immediately available to any other that is there. That's why so often in you look in history, you'll find the same breakthrough in consciousness happens multiple places in the world and they sure as hell didn't get around to talk to each other. There is something, quote, in the air. <laughs> that they latched on to and that consciousness was available to someone else's consciousness unbeknownst to them and that's why we had great movements because that possibility happens and you realize this is the time call it pregnant time call it uh, destinal time call it whatever you, you know uh, time you want, but there is a time for things to happen. So, and it's true in your life. <clears throat> and I believe that what your life is about is being awake so that when that time happens, at least it doesn't go past you, you know. You, you, damn, this is, isn't it fascinating that I'm talking to this person? Maybe, just maybe, is it, this is a, a crystal for something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But that's what it means to live your life out of quote, what we call live out of possibility. Possibility is about the, the ability to say each and every situation has within it a seed. And whether you're contributing to its crystallization or, or its growth or what have you, you have no idea. Maybe it was just your, all you needed to do was just dump on it and give it a little fertilizer and somebody else will harvest it. You don't know. 
I mean, if, if, if you live some other way, you think you're the center of the universe, you know. Everything is sort of happening in and through me. That's, you know, that's, that's stupid. But when you're genuinely participating in life, that's the way you encounter, as if everything you do is contributing in a way to this happening. I'm feeling a little dizzy. I'm being invited to grasp me in a way that is bigger and deeper and richer and more interconnected with my neighbor and all that is than I have previously explored. In the eyes of my neighbor, I am beginning to see the universal. Come with me now as we seek a place to be where deep is connected to deep, where everywhere is nowhere, where everywhere is now here. <laughs> 